Good afternoon. Uh, this is CIBE 638, Sedimentation Engineering, and I'm Professor Victor Ponce in San Diego State University, Department of Civil Engineering. And today is class number 061, meaning the sixth week, the first lecture of two lectures that we usually do every week. Uh, today the subject is a new subject, is the sixth week. Uh, so it is on geomorphology. So let me get into it. Fluvial geomorphology, channel morphology is kind of the same thing. Uh, and uh, the subject we're going to cover today are CO1. Hopefully we'll get to CO6 because we have, we have how many weeks? We have three weeks. We got 29, CO5, CO6, roughly five items per day. This is our speed. Uh, so, um, so the first topic that I have in here, the first theme, is the paper, the classical paper by Leopold and Maddock, 1953. This paper is titled The Hydraulic Geometry of Stream Channels and Some Physiographic Implications. U.S. Geological Survey Professional Paper 252. So this is the paper that we put together in a thumb uh, fashion many years ago, scanned the paper. And I do believe that this is not the entire paper. It's only the first 16 pages because the objective is to, to teach this stuff, to make people aware of this stuff exists and so forth. And I didn't think it was necessary because I usually do not go through the entire paper. As a matter of fact, in this case, we're not even going to go to two pages of this paper. Why? Because I'll tell you in a minute why. But let me just get in here. Uh, suffice it to say that Luna B. Leopold is one of the foremost uh, geomorphologists, fluvial geomorphologists in the United States, uh, and also Thomas Maddock. So this paper is a must in learning sediment sedimentation and certainly um, fluvial geomorphology, which is it's all related. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my professor, Daryl Simons, who taught uh, three courses at the time that I took from him in the early 70s, uh, he emphasized this course and he personally, I think, commented that he had met Luna B. Leopold. So this is the paper that Luna B. Leopold and his associate Thomas Maddock wrote in 1953. So that's exactly 59 years ago. And I'm just going to cover the intro in here. Let me pull this up a little bit, a little bigger for you to see a little, a little better way. Okay, some hydraulic characteristics of stream channels. What are they? Depth, width, velocity, suspended load are measured quantitatively and vary with discharge as simple power functions that are given river cross sections. In other words, what these people are doing is they're going to present a whole theory of algebra of the variables in the river. It's, it's, straight, it's going to be straight algebra, as a matter of fact, which is good because at the time there was not even that. So it was a good step, uh, step forward. It, it was a good step because it's still a simple step understood by anybody because it's just straight algebra. There's no differential equations in there. And yet they, uh, they, are, they get a, a lot of, uh, uh, I guess you could say, bang for the buck. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had a, one of our faculty members at San Diego State who is no longer with the faculty for various reasons, but several years ago, he had a, a contract uh, to do modeling in South America, in the Amazon Basin. And he used uh, this methodology that I'm going to present today. So it's a very popular methodology, methodology useful and well-known. So... The functions that uh, Leopold derived for the cross-section um, differ in numerical values and coefficients. These functions are width, power function of discharge, depth, power function of discharge, velocity, power function of discharge, sediment load, they call it L. Uh, it's unusual. I, I'm not used to L as sediment load, but I guess you got to go back to 1953 and talk to Leopold about it. But at any rate, these are the values where W is the width, D is the mean velocity, v, v is the mean, I'm sorry, D is the mean depth, 
V is the mean velocity and L is the suspended sediment load. And Q is the discharge. In A, K, all the variables, coefficients and exponents that you see in there are empirical and they need to be determined by resorting to data. Fortunately, by the time that uh, these two gentlemen did this in 1953, there was about 80 years of data that the Geological Survey had put together. Interestingly, the Geological Survey was an agency that I believe was uh, created in the year 1887. 1887, 1953, already 50 years of data of the Geological Survey. A great agency, by the way. One of the, one of the five water agencies in the United States. Why is there five water agencies? That's an interesting story. I guess you could say that at the beginning of the country, uh, the Army Corps was given the job of doing, Army Corps of Engineers was given the job of doing the navigation and flood control. And then subsequently, um, Congress, in their wisdom, as they say, felt necessary to give other sections of the water business to other agencies that they were creating, creating as they went along. Uh, 1887, the Geological Survey, 1935, the Soil Conservation Service, um, uh, the Bureau of Rec was created in 1903. They have, they, all of these agencies had specific purviews, specific areas where they were going to work. So at the end, uh, we ended up with several water agencies. There's about five or six of them. Uh, uh, the Forest Service, the Park Service, they're all dealing specifically with some subject, but also related to water, sediment, nutrients, etc. But let me not deviate from the topic here. Um, so what, what uh, Leopold and Maddock are going to do, they're going to do algebra in here, supported with data, or with data that they, uh, they have, uh, the data from the geological survey. But now what I'm going to say is the following. This paper is a very good paper. But I'm not going to review it because I already told you what they're going to be doing. They're going to be doing some algebra with data in order to get the uh, hydraulic geometry. They call it dehydraulic geometry of stream channels and physiographic implications that are derived from dehydraulic geometry. But what actually happened what the, this, was that this gentleman, uh, the stuff that they put together was uh, rewritten in a better way, somewhat clearer way, by none other that um, let me see Leopold the hydraulic geometry this is it yeah this is it I guess Leopold wrote a paper many years later oh 30 or 40 years later and this actually is not a paper it's a book and you know when you write a book uh, you gotta come down a little bit in the level uh, because you gotta sell the book the, uh, the, uh, the paper, you don't have to sell. The paper is published for everybody to respect and read. But this is a book where Leopold kind of regurgitated uh, everything he had, he had said in the 1953 paper. I believe I, I gave my, came across this paper in the 90s. Uh, not, it's not a paper, it's a book. I, I have that book. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over this paper. And it's so, I'm sorry, the book, I, I keep calling it paper. It's a book, and we have the view and to print. So I believe the view is a little larger. So let's go ahead and take a look at the view. So what do we have in here? The same thing, written by the same author, as a matter of fact. It says, at a river cross section, as discharge changes, the following generalities usually hold. Depth and velocity increase substantially with increasing discharge. Width increases slightly with discharge. Channel flow resistance or hydraulic roughness decreases slightly with increasing discharge. We know that from uh, the studies that Simons had done in the, in the middle 50s. Simons and Richardson. Uh, water surface slope does not change. Suspended load increases very fast with discharge, as we will see this later on in much detail and at a much higher rate than any other parameter. Suspended load varies a whole lot. That is why it is very difficult to pin down suspended load. And we would take, remember I said that, we would take errors up to 100% on calculation of suspended load because the suspended load varies so much because of what uh, Leopold said in here that it's hard to pin down. The others, not so much. The width doesn't change a whole lot. Interest, interesting story that when I went to Colorado State back in the early 70s, 
in, uh, in our early discussions with Khalid Mahmoud, who was my de facto advisor at the time. I was under Simons, but Simons had a big operation out there, and he had a lot of, a lot of assistance. And Khalid Mahmoud was one of his junior faculty. And uh, I, uh, we discussed the issue of doing a dissertation, as a matter of fact. And Khalid Mahmoud said, Pons, I believe the issue of width is important. We don't know at this point, this was 1973, we don't know it <laughs> almost 50 years ago, we don't know at this point the function, functions that determine the width. So this is a good subject that you could pick up as a dissertation topic. What could I say? I said, okay, fine, I'm going to look at, look at it. And then eventually, within a, couple, a year or so, I decided that that was a subject that I should not get into because it was going to be too long. And I wasn't in there forever going to school. So I said to him, I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to decline on this subject. I know it's an important subject, but I think uh, uh, it has a lot to do with other things that not necessarily uh, morphology. There's soils in there and so forth, chemistry and stuff, which I'm not familiar with. So I declined and subsequently I picked up another subject, which we will talk about later. But at this point, the width, as, as Leopold says in here, the width increases slightly with discharge. We don't know exactly how much or how. At this point, we don't know. There's a bunch of other stories that I could, I could talk, I could t uh, t tell you at that time, at this time, but I'm not going to. We'll wait for the appropriate time. But so this is the this is what he he has come up with, and these are the relations. These are the relations that Leopold has come up with. Okay, so now I'm going to go in here. I'm, I'm getting a little bit lost in here. Uh, number two. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Now he's going to show us how this thing operates. With depth and velocity in relation to discharge. Powder River near Locate, Montana. So they plot the data for width in terms of discharge. At a site, at a point. Likewise in here, and as you can see, because the, the width times the depth times the velocity is the discharge, then these three uh, exponents need to add to one. Algebraically, it has to be that way. So sure enough, 28 plus 42 is 0 0.7, plus 0 0.3 is 1. So this matches. It makes sense. The greatest attention has been devoted to the first three relations because Q equal W du and thus B plus F plus M equal to 1. That has to match, otherwise there's something wrong in the data. And right there, that looks good. Note that he didn't say the correlation coefficients, but to me, these correlation coefficients look like 0.8, point, at least 0.7, if not 0.8. So they're good. They're good. So then, I mean, we got it in here. I am getting, I didn't do it right, but we're going to go out here, here anyway. So that is the variation that they refer to at a point, at a section, at a cross section. But discharge width and depth also vary in the downstream direction. And they vary in a, in a different fashion. Not actually, not different fashion. They vary so that they, you can find similar equations, but they, ha they don't have the same coefficient or exponent. So that's what they call the variation in the, down, in the downstream direction. Over here, they have another plot in here. With depth and velocity in relation to mean annual discharge as discharge varies downstream. And as you can see, they have, they have different exponents. They have not said what the exponents are in here. But this is the same river, just different tributaries. I'm going to go back in here. I should have prepared this a little better, but I didn't. Okay. Mean annual discharge. This is for different rivers now at this point. With depth and velocity in relation to mean annual discharge, as discharge increases downstream in various, various river systems. Okay. So now we're going to get to the in, in, important part here. This is the important part. Diagrammatic representation of relation of width, depth, and velocity to discharge at a station and downstream. 
This is the major or the main contribution of Leopold and Madoff, 1953. They compare at a station in here and downstream over here, from here to here, downstream, A to D, and A to B is at a station. Actually, A to C is at a station. So and they plotted the graphs, just like the graphs we saw, but we saw them in two different graphs. Now they put them in one, into one same graph, velocity, depth, and width, and also the sediment load. And as you can see, the sediment load varies a whole lot, and that's why they have this huge range in here. Channel roughness, not too much. River slope, not too much. So by looking at these variations or these formulas, the data, one could determine the hydraulic relations or hydraulic geometry for any river, or any river, as a matter of fact, in the world. And this has been done in many places. So this is the study of uh, Leopold. Our next uh, subject that we have in here is, is a tale, Einstein on meanders. And I'm going to go on to the vector and then to the raster because it's just a complement, okay? So in 1926, the renowned physical scientist, or rather physicist, physicist, Einstein, Albert Einstein, was invited to give a lecture at the Prussian Academy and interestingly chose the topic of river meandering. Now what does Albert Einstein have to do with river meandering? We will see, because we are going to go through his paper. His son, the famed UC Berkeley professor, Hans Einstein, turned to river hydraulics after practicing several years as a structural engineer. Interestingly, uh, at one time, I had seen this quoted, because I didn't invent it. I read it somewhere. And one day, many years, oh, many, many years ago, 30, maybe, maybe 30 years, and one day I decided that uh, I was going to go find the original source. So I went to the library looking for the works of Einstein, and to my surprise, I found maybe an entire shelf of what the, no, I'm exaggerating here, but he had written a lot of books, and I could not at the time sit down and patiently try to figure out where exactly was this particular quote. But it is somewhere because I have read it. I did not invent it. Uh, Albert Einstein told his son in 1928 to go back uh, because he wanted to go back to school to study something related to what he was doing, engineering, civil engineering. He says, why don't you go and study sedimentation? Not too many people know much about it. The elder Einstein had a keen interest. We can surmise that the elder Einstein had a keen interest in meandering and encouraged his son to pursue a career in river hydraulics. Why? Because in 1926, when he gave that lecture in Germany, Eastern Germany, he specifically talked about meandering. I'm sure that it happened this way. They asked Einstein, who by that time was a very famous person, having gotten the Nobel Prize. I believe he got the Nobel Prize in the year, uh, it could have been nine, 1910 or something like that, for the relativity, the theory of relativity. Then he went on to become very famous uh, in Germany and all over the world. So he was invited to give a lecture and I'm sure he asked, uh, like I always do, what we have to talk about. And they said, well, you know, you can talk about anything you want. So he talked about meandering for our benefit later on because it was great. It was a great paper. We're going to look into it in a few minutes here. Professor Einstein went on to study at uh, Swiss Polytechnic, one of the best schools in Switzerland, uh, sedimentation engineering. And then he came to the United States, late 30s and he had to come and uh, because of the issue with the war. And then uh, one thing led to another and 10 years later, he was teaching at Berkeley. Why was that? Because in 1950, he published a paper called the bed load function for, set from, for sediment transportation in open channels. And being who he was, and it was a great paper, and I guess what happened was that the University of Cal Berkeley invited him to be a professor out there. So he spent the next 23 to 25 years teaching after he passed away. Uh, many of the methods that we are going to be discussing in detail later on have to do with uh, professor, professor Einstein's method as the basis of it. The Einstein method led to the modified Einstein 
and then the modified Einstein led to the Kobe method, the, the two Kobe methods that we have. So to this day, we're still practicing, practicing the ideas that Einstein set forth in the year 1950. Interestingly enough, um, Einstein published uh, the son, I mean, the younger Einstein published his paper when he was employed by the Soil Conservation Service. He was employed by the Soil Conservation Service in 1990, and then, I'm sorry, 1950. And then after that, then he became a professor at the uh, University of California. Okay, Einstein's discussion on the cause of meanders is characteristically insightful. He's very insightful, as a matter of fact. His attribution of secondary currents to the Coriolis force was among the first. What is the Coriolis force? I'll, I'll get into it later on in a minute here. Everybody talks about it and very few people quite understand exactly what it is or how does it originate. His explanation of how meanders form due to a balance between inertial and frictional forces in a direction perpendicular to the motion is masterful. I say that because um, for many years, as I was beginning my career, I spent about 10 years just looking at the subject. But I was looking at it in the direction of motion, not in the direction perpendicular to the motion. That was too much for me. I figured if I can do the direction of motion, there would be enough. And sure enough, that actually happened. My S curve, of which some of you may have heard in our course on computational hydraulics, I was derived on uh, studying the balance, the relative balance of all the four forces involved. Now, Einstein was looking at the relative balance of the forces across the direction of motion. And of course, he didn't do any calculations. He had all the right ideas, but he didn't do any calculations because obviously he was just giving a, a lecture, a talk, uh, the beginning of something, perhaps in the future. But I don't think he got too much, the elder Einstein, got too much involved because I don't recall, and I certainly have not read any any papers that were written by the elder Einstein. The younger Einstein, yes, but not the elder Einstein, okay? So, Einstein's explanations have helped us come closer to unraveling the mysteries of river meandering. And he has, by the way. So now I'm going to go and show you the video that I put together a couple of years ago during the pandemic. I put together a lot of videos during the pandemic. In 1926, the renowned physicist Albert Einstein was invited to give a lecture at the Prussian Academy and, interestingly, chose the topic of river meandering. His son, the famed UC Berkeley professor Hans Albert Einstein, turned to river hydraulics after practicing several years as a structural engineer. We can surmise that the elder Einstein had a keen interest in meandering and encouraged his son to pursue a career in river hydraulics. In 1950, Professor Einstein... Do all rivers meander? And the answer is no. There are meandering rivers, there are straight rivers, and there are, there are um, the third type, um, braided, meandering straight and braided. So not all rivers do meander. But one of the conditions is that the, um, the slope should be, should be very mild for the rivers to meander. The valley must have already been formed before the rivers start to meander. Okay, so this is uh, Professor Einstein, Einstein. made his mark in the nascent field of sedimentation engineering with his paper on me... Einstein made his mark in the nascent field of sedimentation engineering with his paper on bed load transport, the forerunner to the methods that are now used in practice. By the way, this is a, not an easy paper to read. I can't say that I read it all. Maybe 90% I understood and so forth. Um, but that is a fact. Um, we obviously are going to cover it too, but probably not 100%. Einstein's discussion on the cause of meanders is characteristically insightful. His attribution of secondary currents 
to the Coriolis force was among the first. His explanation of how meanders form due to a balance between inertial and frictional forces in a direction perpendicular to the motion is masterful. Einstein's explanations have helped us come closer to unraveling the mysteries of river meandering. Okay, so that is the raster on Einstein on meanders. So now we're going to move on to the cause of the formation of meanders in the courses of rivers in the so-called Bear's Law. I believe I'm pronouncing it correctly, Bear's, B-A-E-R. The cause of the formation of meanders in the courses of rivers and in the so-called Bear's Law. Read before the Prussian Academy, January 7, 1926, and published, and then it became out of a book because everything that Einstein put together was eventually translated into English and many other languages, I presume. So I got a hold of the book many years ago, maybe 20 years ago, and scanned this part on the, um, the cause of, of the formation of meanders. Let's make sure that we see, we make this visible. Okay, there we go. So let's play to be Einstein a little bit here for the next 15 minutes. It is common knowledge that streams tend to curve in serpentine shapes instead of following the line of the maximum declivity. Common knowledge, yes, they do. Not all of them do, and there's an explanation for that, but let's, let's just sit tight and wait. It is also well known to geographers that the rivers of the northern hemisphere tend to erode chiefly on the right side. And I don't know why he said that. He certainly was not a geographer, uh, but uh, he was a scientist. And people that really discuss these issues typically are engineers or geomorphologists. The rivers of the southern hemisphere behave in the opposite manner. Northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere. So this has got something to do with, with uh, rotation of the earth, because the earth does rotate. So this is Bear's law, according to what he said. They're opposite direction of uh, forces cause exactly opposite behavior in the northern as opposed to the southern hemisphere. Many attempts have been made to explain this phenomenon, and I'm not sure whether anything I say in the following pages will be new to the expert. Some of my considerations are certainly known. Now, this is interesting, because the question is, did I, was Einstein the first one that ever talked about meanders, 1926? And the answer is no. If you go look at the literature, there were some people out there that had done some studies prior to his work, maybe 10, 20 years earlier. Einstein, though, got a lot of the credit because he was Einstein. Okay, that's what he's saying here. He was a humble person. Now, he didn't say, I did it, but um, he certainly got the credit for, because of being Einstein. Having found nobody who was thoroughly familiar with the causal relations, the cause, he was interested in the cause of it a physical scientist, mechanic approach, mechanistic approach. I think it's a, it is appropriate to give a short qualitative exposition of them. Did he do a qualitative or quantitative? And the answer is qualitative. He didn't put a number into anything. He was just saying, these are the processes. And we will get into his thoughts and see that they were very deep thoughts in terms of the mechanics. Okay, so let's move on in here. Um, he's talking about erosion, okay? Uh, erosion of the bank in question. When there's e e erosion or rather meandering, there's gonna be erosion on one side and deposition in the other. I've shown you several in the video that we just saw, there's several examples of this case. So the river is trying to wind down and it does so by erode, eroding the banks and kicking the sand from one side to the other. Okay, I begin with a little experiment with anybody can easily repeat. Imagine a flat-bottomed cup, cup full of tea. 
At the bottom there are some tea leaf, leaves, which stay there because they are rather heavier than the liquid they, are dis they have displaced. If the liquid is made to rotate by a spoon, the leaves will soon collect in the center of the bottom of the cup. The explanation of this phenomenon is as follows. The rotation of the liquid causes a centrifugal force to act on it. This in itself would give rise to no change in the flow if the latter rotated like a solid body, but it doesn't. It kind of deforms because it has shear. In the neighborhood of the walls of the cup, the liquid is restrained by friction. So friction, the no-slip condition on the size of the cup produces a gradient, a gradient of forces, right? Like the other forces out there being involved so that the angular velocity with which it rotates is less than that in other places near the center. So there's, there's an issue of rotation and then mechanics of the rotation itself. In particular, the angular velocity and therefore the centrifugal force will be... 274, what did we do in here? Yeah, will be, right, 274, I'm getting lost in here. Influence of friction. The same sort of thing happens with a curving stream, figure two. There it is, the curving stream. This is the meandering stream. At every cross section there where it is bent, centrifugal force operates in the direction of the outside of the curve. This force is less near the bottom where the speed of the current is reduced by friction than higher above the bottom. And this causes a circular movement of the kind illustrated in the diagram. So he's basically saying, to reiterate what he's saying, or to put it in some other perhaps simpler terms, that there are forces across the plane of the, of the sheet of paper. And that those forces need to be, they are responsible for the actual formation of the meanders. And I do believe that that is the case, by the way. How did the forces originate at the beginning? Because they were not supposed to be there. It was supposed to be a one-dimensional process and yet ended up being a three-dimensional process. That is another thing that he's going to talk eventually. Okay. Um, it's, it says, the latter produces a Coriolis force acting transversally to the direction of the current, whose right-hand horizontal component amounts to 2V omega sine phi per unit of mass. Etc. I'm not going to get too much into the mechanics, but what I want to say at this point is that the Coriolis force is related to the gradient in forces that occur because the world is round and it is rotating. And all these rivers that we are analyzing or we're looking into are just kind of hanging out there on the surface of the Earth. And the Earth's moving. So there's got to be some relation between the movement of the Earth upon its axis, 24 hours for a full rotation, and the objects right on top of the Earth, and these are the rivers. Now, if it were a solid uh, uh, per, a thing, it would be different than it is fluid, because the fluid is subject to relations with the boundary, which the object, the solid object, is not. And we know that. We know that fluid mechanics is, is difficult because of that because the stuff is all moving all over the place and reacting and con considering different types of forces, gravity, friction, inertia, pressure gradient, etc. We know all that. We've studied that extensively. Okay, so Coriolis force is important. The Coriolis force is important. The fact that uh, the rivers are out there hanging. So I do believe that the way it happens is like this, according to what Einstein said. At the beginning, the forces are not the, the river is a straight line, but because it is rotating and the Coriolis force associated with the rotation causes deviations which uh, render the river not a one-dimensional flow, simple problem, but rather a two-dimensional and even three-dimensional flow. So that is the origin of the meandering. Now, how can we avoid meanders? We can't. If meanders are fo forming and developing, you cannot avoid them. You can fight it as my friend in Colombia has done for the last 25 years, almost 30 years now. You can fight it, you can, you can try to pin it down, as he has done kind of successfully. I think I already told you that of 18 projects that he had done, one failed over the course of 20 years. The other 18 are still standing. That's when I decided to call him a time engineer because I told him, we're friends, okay, I can say that. 
I said, Carlos, it's a matter of time before your projects all fail. But sure enough, you're not going to be here to see all of them because it's going to take like 20, 50, 100 years. And these others is not going to be there. One already failed, but the others, it's a matter of time. So why people actually hire this gentleman to do all this if, if, if it's gonna, all going to fail? And the answer is yes, it will fail, but it will fail. Nobody will, nobody will see it, not the people right now. The probability is that they're not going to see it because it's too long. All hydraulics is like that. We designed dams to fail. The one that we designed in Peru back uh, 12, 13 years ago, we said it should fail in the 10,000 year flood because that was the standard. The 10,000 year flood, you had to wait 10,000 years for it to happen? No, no, hydrology doesn't work that way. It could happen tomorrow, but if it does happen tomorrow, it will take a ha another 1,000 years to come back. So we hope that it's not coming back. And that's why we designed those huge dams for this huge frequency. In the United States, it's interesting, and this is a side comment, but it is important. Back in the early 60s, like 50 years ago, uh, hydrologists in the federal agencies and other agencies decided, in academia also, decided that they couldn't trust the 80 years of data that they had. Because 80 years is a very small window in the issue of nature. How long has nature, has nature been around? Long time. So then they developed a concept which was not based on, on statistics or, or on data. It was a, a total concept. They call it probable maximum flood. And that is where we design now with the problem maximum flood. Now, when I was in Peru with this project in the year 2008, uh, you go back to a country or go into a country that doesn't have a problem maximum flood, and then what do you do? Well, there's actually various ways of doing it. But one of the ways is to use the 10,000 year flood. That's also done in Mexico, by the way. In the United States, we typically or technically, we should not use the 10,000 year flood. We have maps to determine the PMF, the problem maximum flood. So that's enough. That's supposed to be better technology. Supposed to be. I, I say supposed to be because nobody's sure of just about anything because everything, there's always a possibility of failure out there. So having said that, now I'm going to finish in here the, uh, the discussion on, on Einstein's only to, to reiterate that he gave us a lot of light. He said Coriolis force, rotation of the earth, and also the balance of forces across the plane of the, of the one-dimensional flow. And that is correct. Okay, now, the question is, um, again, reiterating the issue of can we fix meanders? And the answer is no, we can't. We can try to postpone it, but not fix it. Why? Because meandering is a natural process. We should first understand the nature of the process so that we perhaps could do something about it later. And the fact of the matter is that we still do not have a three-dimensional model of all the forces. I believe the Europeans have, are doing strides in this regard, but I haven't used it because I, feel, I figure it's, it's out of my ball of wax already. I'm too old to be dealing with those things, but I know that I've heard stories about there's three-dimensional models, three-dimensional numerical models. Now, I did when I was young the one-dimensional model, and then we got into the two-dimensional model that was in the 70s and 80s, but we actually never got to the three-dimensional models. We had to wait 20 years or 30 years for that to happen, and by that time, you know, I was already too old. There's younger people out there that are doing the work, right? But the point I'm making at this point is that I do not believe at this point that we can completely and successfully model three-dimensional models so that we can examine exactly how is it that the forces uh, compare within the, between themselves and within themselves in a meandering situation. Okay, having said that, then I'm going to move on to the next subject. And that's what, that one's called Mississippi River Walk at Mud Island, Memphis. And this is a video. Interestingly, I was there three months ago. And you know, Professor Pons, everywhere I go, I take my camera, my video camera together and hopefully do a video. And we did a video of the Mississippi River Walk. I think you'll be interested. I'm not exactly sure when this model was put together, but it's a model of the entire Mississippi, I believe from Carroll, I think the entire Mississippi. Let's take a look.
So you can go to Memphis, when you visit Memphis, and go to this model. I don't recall the scale at this point, but this is a geometric scale reduced model of the entire Mississippi, I believe from Cairo to the Gulf, Mississippi River Walk. You can walk the entire river. I think I read, uh, uh, it's in the model, that uh, one foot is about a mile, something like that. that's the scale. One foot is a mile. And this is a very big model. It's out there uh, at Mud Island in um, in uh, Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Mud Island is uh, is an island within the river. It's been there a long time, I presume. It was formed. I don't know exactly when it was formed, but there is where they have this model. So if you're out there in Memphis, uh, I would recommend that you go out there and take a look, as I did. This is only three months ago. That's the beginning of the model, by the way. It starts over here. And I, if I am 100%, I'm not 100% correct, but Cairo is around here somewhere. Cairo, Illinois. Look at the meandering of the Mississippi. That is really amazing, isn't it? Well, um, that has re related or led to stories of uh, cuts in the river. Like you could do a cut in here and bypass the entire meander. And that has happened in the lower Mississippi, by, by the way, extensively. Nowadays, we do not recommend that we do that, but it has been done. And there's a story on that that I will get there eventually. <laughs> Well, that's the scale in there. Every step that a visitor takes is equivalent to roughly equivalent to one mile of river. If you recognize the background music, I use that uh, music in our class videos. That's uh, Offenbach's uh, Tales of Hoffman, very famous song.
Okay, our next uh, paper is Friedkin's Laboratory Study of the Meandering of Alluvial Rivers, U.S. Waterways Experiment Station, Vicksburg, Mississippi, 1945. This is an interesting and very comprehensive study that was done uh, by Friedkin in 1945. He was working with the U.S. Waterways Experiment Station at Vicksburg, Mississippi. I believe I was there once, right. The uh, That's a lab, it's a wet lab that the Army Corps of Engineers has at Vicksburg. Uh, interestingly, the, we, I should mention at this point, the Army Corps has four, no, three, three wet labs. They call them wet labs because they deal with hydraulics. They, they've got other labs, but basically I'm telling you, I don't know about them. They must have at least 10 labs throughout the United States. But we are familiar with the water. In the water, in the water labs, the Vicksburg lab is the bigger one. Uh, it was there that um, the hydraulic modeling, physical hydraulic modeling has been done for many, perhaps all the Army Corps. I'm not going to say all of them for sure, but many, I would say many of the Army Corps uh, dams that were built throughout the United States were modeled uh, out there at Vicksburg. Modeled out there at Vicksburg, yes. Uh, through the turn of the century, a year, uh, a century, 120 years ago, when hydraulic modeling uh, started in earnest, it was 1900, 1920, 1940, 1960. This is when the uh, experiment station at Vicksburg was developed and grew to the strength that it has right now. now. I'm not sure how many employees do they have, but I know they used to have a lot, not as many nowadays. So that's our first lab. Uh, in this, I'm saying I'm making that comment because Friedkin was working and he wrote this paper while he was employed with the U.S. Waterway Experiment Station. While I'm talking about it, there's another lab which is called the uh, the Heck Lab, Hydrologic Engineering Center, which since 1968 originates the Heck models, HEC models. Among them, HEC RAS, HEC uh, HMS. Uh, hydraulic mo hydrologic modeling system and uh, the RAS's river analysis system. Those are the two models, uh, computer models, that the Army Corps supports out of their HEC lab in Davis, Davis, California. I've actually visited with them for a couple of times. I, I was doing some work with them in the 80s, but uh, not anymore. But they're still there. They still work. I have a, a couple of acquaintances out there. So that's the second lab. The third lab, where is the third wet lab of the U.S. Army Corps? That's out there in New Hampshire, at Dartmouth, as a matter of fact. The Coal Regions Lab, the Crowell Lab, Coal Regions Research and Engineering Lab. That's where they do all the ice modeling and so forth. I was actually out there once. I don't recall exactly. It was in 84, 85, so that's almost 20, oh, not 20, not 40, 35 years ago. So I, I'm okay. I don't remember everything, but the point is that I was there. It was in uh, Dartmouth, New Hampshire. I think I was there to visit with a gentleman that I had befriended, or and uh, I wanted to get a pick his brains on the issue of diffusion wave modeling, which was some of the subjects that I was doing at the time. I don't recall his name right now, but uh, he's he's a good man, a professor out there at Dartmouth at the time. I don't know where he's right now. It's 35 years later. But that, that's a story on the wet labs, and Friedkin wrote this paper, which I dutifully at one time scanned, but I obviously am not going not gonna to go through the entire paper. I welcome those of you that are interested in meandering to read the entire paper. It's a little bit boring because it's kind of repetitive, but it's a good paper for those of us, I guess, that love meandering and want to know everything about meandering. So what do we have in here? The problem. The meandering of alluvial rivers, let me see if I can expand this a little bit refers to the continually changing sinus course, sinuous, I'm sorry, sinuous course developed by rivers flowing in erodible alluvial sediments. The problem was twofold. First, to determine the basic principles of meandering, the stuff that Einstein had tried to do in 1926. And second, to determine the basic principles as to changes brought about in the channel of a meandering river by stabilization of the caving banks. In other words, they wanted to do or to study what would what could ha ha happen if we start fixing or messing with the river and trying to change the meanders or otherwise 
not let them do this or do that. Obviously, the river is going to react. The river wants to go in a certain way. If we start fighting and messing with it, the river will react and go in the opposite way. Typically, that's what happens. So we got to be prepared for the reaction. If we're not prepared, then we don't know what we're doing. I know the Army Corps knows what they're doing. They've been at this for a long time. So they have a laboratory, uh, the scope. They, they re he refers to the scope. And then he shows the, the graphs. And what he's basically saying at this point is that they tried in the laboratory channel initially to work with, in the laboratory, you got to work with small scale models. And that's exactly what they did. Like at Colorado State, remember in 1950s, this was done in the early 40s. And they put a straight channel in there and let it go to see what happens. And as you can see what it says in here, initial channel, after three hours, it started, it started changing. I am not sure at this point I didn't write this paper, uh, and I have not read it completely for at least 10 or 20 years. But the point is they put a curve in here, and that caused, obviously that caused the curve to move on and developed four hours, six hours, as you can see. Back in here. Again, we are lost in here. Okay, and now this is in discussion. Observation of the behavior of the small scale river, that's the small scale river that they're looking into in the lab, as it began to meander show that a local disturbance to the flow was created by a sandbar which resulted from bank erosion. Sand from caving banks overloaded the stream and deposition took place. This test indicated that aside from the changing conditions and irregular bank lines, rivers will, which erode their banks will meander simply because a flow of water has a limited capacity for carrying sand along its bed. The only requirement is bank erosion. So basically he's saying, if the bank is erodible, the river will meander. But that's not the fundamental reason for it, I do believe. I think we've studied this for a long time. And I actually, as a matter of fact, I should mention that uh, a large portion of my dissertation was precisely that, uh, to study the meandering and to see what, uh, uh, to fundament the fundamental cause of meandering. We did not answer everything, but we came up with some very good predictions of the wavelength of the meanders, meanders. The wavelengths, wavelengths under ideal conditions. And the ideal conditions were the, one, were the ones that we had over in Pakistan, which uh, Pakistan had built 12 long, very wide, I mean, not wide, but large channels. They were on the order of 20,000 to 25,000 CFS. Widths on the order of, the larger width was 1,000 feet, I believe. That's a huge channel. And they did that, that in the late 40s and 50s. Throughout the 50s, they were designing these channels, 50s and 60s. And then in the 1970s, then five to 10 years after they, these channels were designed and built, they were straight channels, or designed to be straight. But they had erodible banks, and they, channel, they started to meander, obviously, as freaking would have predicted. Any channel that moves, straight channel that moves in an erodible bank will eventually meander. So these channels in Pakistan decided, or rather started to meander. And uh, Professor Mahmoud, who was my advisor at that time, had developed a research project to study and to see what could be done to control it. And fortunately, I was there, signed up, and enrolled on the program. And I went over there for three months to take a look at this problem and see what could be done in terms of fixing it. Well, mostly our work was mostly analysis, not necessarily fixing it. You know, when you start to fix somebody, you got to get into the politics. And we were not politicians. We said, well, we're going to figure out what's causing this. One of our objectives on our dissertation topic was to determine the wavelength, the wavelength of the meander. Because every meander has a certain wavelength, right? And that depends, of course, on the local hydraulics. But beyond that, one of my basic philosophies on meandering is this, and I'm going to share it with you tonight. There's irregularities, and the irregularities cause meandering. Suffice at this point to answer the question, this question which has not been answered. If there are no irregularities, will there be a meander? 
And the answer is, I don't know, because all the rivers are irregular. They have some irregularities. You can't put anything perfect in there. Even in the laboratory, there's irregularities. You may want not for them to be the, to the irregularities to be it, not out there, but they are, in fact. Irregularities are out there. Um, Hayami, when talking just strictly about water, he said the irregularities cause diffusion in just water, not soils or anything like that. We know that for a fact, and it's 100% understood that that is the case. Irregularities in river flow cause diffusion. Now, whether irregularities in river mechanics cause meandering, that is a question that is still up in the air. But I do believe that that is the case. It will be kind of similar to the Hayami thoughts. And I do understand and endorse, completely endorse the Hayami theory, by the, by the way. We have gotten a lot of mileage out of that theory. I am... You know, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I'm, I'm considered to be Mr. Diffusion or Dr. Diffusion because we built our career over the last, uh, the first 20 years around the concept of diffusion wave modeling. That's a fact. Okay, which led us, uh, or it came out as a byproduct of the, the so-called S-curve, which I have already mentioned to you several times. Okay, so that's what I'm going to say at the beginning of this paper or rather covering the beginning of the Friedkin paper. I actually don't know what happened to Friedkin. Uh, this is the only paper that, that I have come across. And I do not know if there exists another paper, perhaps in the, in the journals, where he continues to cover this. As you can see, most of the Friedkin work was experimental. And there's two approaches in science, you know, experimental or theoretical. Or you can do experimental and theoretical, which is probably better. Uh, that's the, that's a fact. Okay, so now we're going to move on to CO seven. We're doing quite uh, fast in here. We uh, let's take a look at good uh, at this uh, this movie. It's a movie. It's a video. It's a fascinating video, by the way. Um, the video is 47, 47 minutes, but uh, it covers everything in in southern Louisiana. Uh, so I'm not gonna load you with a 47 minute video. What I have done is I have abstracted the meat, the meat of it that relates to fluvial geomorphology. And that's what I'm going to show here tonight. So a bridged version of Goodbye Louisiana, 1982. This movie was produced in 1982 in Boston by station WGBH. It, it was a great video. When I found out about it, maybe three or four years later, I decided to own it. So I somehow ended up owning the the tape. You remember in those days we used to work with tapes, VC, VHS, VHS tapes. I don't, you're too young perhaps to remember, but there were such a thing called VHS tape. As a matter of fact, before the VHS, there were the beta tapes, but they uh, eventually succumbed to the VHS. The VHS took over for many years. So I had a VHS tape of this video. That was the year 1985 or 86, three or four years after it got published or was produced. Then in the year 2009, we, our team went on the web and we went on the web, we went on YouTube all big time. And we decided to put all our stuff, even though we hadn't generated it, into, the, into YouTube. And so we did. And among the videos that we had out there lying around, there were about, we had about 10 videos. That we have collected over the years some things that I thought were really important that I, and then I should own a, a, a copy, right? So I own this good by Louisiana. Then subsequently we abridged it. We cut it to seven minutes. Actually, it's nine minutes. So that's what I'm going to show you today. I'm going to feel free to interrupt this video because it has a lot of important concepts that we need to understand. We need to listen, learn, and understand. So here we go. <laughs> By the way, if you recognize the voice of the narrator, this is none other than Bert Lancaster. Parts of Louisiana may indeed be washing away. There are many reasons for this. Most of them have to do with the way...
Louisiana has for millions of years, I would say two, three million, they've been getting all the sediment from the Midwest, the Louisiana Valley, uh, not Louisiana Valley, the Mississippi, Missouri River Valley, all the way to Canada. There's a couple of provinces out there in Canada where actually contribute water and sediment to Louisiana. Days we've engineered the Mississippi River. The river is now fighting back. It wants to change course, and all that stands in its way is this. The old river control structure. Built the river is fighting back, and the river wants to change course. Let me fix this in here. The river wants to change course, and all that's standing in there is the old river control structure. What's going on in here? Well, the Army Corps is in charge of the river. In the army, if the Army Corps in the in the federal government, which of which the Army Corps is an is a, is an arm of the federal government, if they don't want it to change course, they will make everything possible not to allow the river to change course. They actually would be fighting nature. They are fighting nature. They've been doing this for two hundred years, by the way. By the Army Corps of Engineers, but if this structure cannot hold out against the determined river and much of Louisiana is in danger. One of the most serious problems for... If the river decides it wants to change course, the first thing it needs to do is tear, or tear rather, to tear apart the old river control structure. Old river control structure. The control structure, if the control structure is gone, then the river can do whatever it wants. Right now, the old river control structure does not let it do it, right? River boatman was the Mississippi's constant twists and turns. Constant twists and turns, right? We already studied that theoretically. And its disposition to change course altogether. All rivers change from time to time, but the Mississippi is what geographers call a deltaic river. Deltaic river? What is that? Deltaic river means that the river carries sediment and the sediment is deposited in the delta. And the delta is like a delta, like a, a delta, a Greek letter delta. It's a triangle, which it's vertex north, north of the water. And then it spreads the water and the sediment uh, in the delta. There's a delta. La large rivers have deltas, like the delta of the Amazon. Every time the Amazon floods, there's a couple of islands in the delta that move around. Just move like if they walked. Actually, that does happen. And these kinds change more extremely. This is because the river carries over 200 million tons of silt from its... 200 million tons of silt. I'm not sure if that's daily or yearly. It must be yearly. ...banks as it travels down to the Gulf of Mexico. The silt deposits itself along the way. Sandbars build up, which split the... Silt deposits itself along the way. Wasn't that a question that I asked you? Yes, the sill deposits. Why does it deposit? You already know this. Because the slope, the slope does not, does not let it go further all the way to the ocean. The river's path, and the river moves around the new obstruction. More silt settles out of the mouth of the river, creating a delta. There is. It, uh, the sediment is all going all the way to the delta. Is the delta constantly under formation? The answer is yes, but not in the Mississippi. The Mississippi is a river that doesn't have a delta, a natural delta. The delta of the Mississippi is artificial. We'll get there. Most of Louisiana, south of Baton Rouge, was created in this fashion in the last 5,000 years. The New Orleans area is working on solutions to its drinking water problems. There is really no other choice if it is to live in harmony with its growing industrial corridor. But all of the engineering that's been done on the river to make it possible for cities to grow and for industry to move in, all of this depends on one single structure, the old river control structure. Yes, all of the engineering that has been done in the river by the Army Corps, because the Army Corps was given the assignment by Congress to do the engineering in the river. How did this happen? This has been told by many people in terms of how did it happen, but what we know is that in the War of 1812, 
against the British, I believe. The British came over here and they were uh, messing around in the, in the mouth of the Mississippi. And then after the war was settled, um, Congress gave the Army Corps the job of doing the flood control and the navigation. First the navigation and then the Army Corps said, we can't do the navigation without actually doing the flood control, so give us the flood control. So they got charged of the flood control and navigation after the War of 1812, the Army Corps of Engineers, the engineers of the Army of the United States. So since 1812, for 200 years, they've been doing this. And the engineering, you know, engineers, what engineers do? Engineers build. We build. So they decided to build structures here and there, and you'll see many of them. And uh, I believe there's a couple of you that have chosen topics, uh, semester topics, term topics, to discuss the issues of the building of structures in the Mississippi. Common. So it would be not, not it would just not be the last time we talk about this. Some of you will actually describe this in more detail. Only referred to by its initials, the ORCS. The ORCS, Old River Control Structure. This is the weak link in the chain that ties the Mississippi River and its cities and industries together. Weak link? Well, let's not forget that this film or this video was done in 1982. In 1986, I was there. And the Army, in true fashion, was obviously trying to defend what they had to defend. So they were planning, and it was uh, there was new all river control structure under construction in 1986. I believe later on, maybe two, three years later, it was inaugurated. So now there is two bastions of defense out there. The old river control structure and the new old river control structure. They're both out there trying to make sure that the Mississippi does not go where it wants to go. Because if this structure fails, then the Mississippi River wins. He's, he's talking in 1982. That means he had no idea that the Army Corps would come up with a new old river control structure in 1986 or 87. It will join another river. The Mississippi winds. It will join another river. Okay, let's take a look. What river? The Atchafalaya to take a new path to the Gulf of Mexico. In other words, what he's saying, perhaps not in so much detail, is that the river was going on one side of the delta, and what it is going to do from now on, presumably, is go on the other side of the delta. And in the other side of the delta, the river is called Achafalaya, just like it sounds, Achafalaya. The consequences for Baton Rouge in New Orleans, for the industrial corridor, and for the coast and the swamps of Louisiana would be devastating. Why would it be devastating? Because the river is going to go somewhere else. There's not going to be any river out there next to Baton Rouge or New Orleans, for that matter. The river will be on the Atchafalaya branch out there somewhere, a couple hundred miles. I mean, I don't know exactly the distance, but it's a long distance. It's a big mouth. It's a big river. It drains the entire Mississippi River Basin, which covers the central part of the United States all the way up to Canada. The background for this potential disaster began way back in the 15th century when the Mississippi made a broad meander. And in the Mississippi made a broad meander. Yes, 15th century. Right, 500 years ago. Intersected with the Red River and its small branch, the Atchafalaya. So the Mississippi intersected. This is the Mississippi over here. The Mississippi over here. And it made a broad meander and then intercepted with the Red River and the Atchafalaya. And Red River went into the Atchafalaya. Red River, I believe, coming from Arkansas, north of here. At that time, the Atchafalaya was more a stream than a river because it naturally caused 30 mile long log jam that built up over the centuries, blocking its connection to the other rivers. So the Atchafalaya had been blocked by nature. A log jam had blocked the Atchafalaya. So the Atchafalaya was nothing, nothing of a stream, a very small stream. In 1831, Henry Shreve, a riverboat captain, 
Here's the gentleman that gave his name to Shreveport in Louisiana, Henry Shreve. He was a boat captain. In other words, his business was uh, working with the boats, I mean, driving actually, the boats that went through the Mississippi, a boat captain in the Mississippi River. Organized a project to get rid of the Mississippi's meander because river boatmen found it difficult to navigate. They dug a new channel, which the Mississippi readily accepted. Right there. So Shreve went in there and made a cut on the Mississippi, obviously because he felt that it would be much shorter for him in, time, in terms of time spent to go from here to here or from here to back here rather than to have to go around the bend. This issue of bend cutting is something that has been done throughout the world, but it has never led to positive answers because the river has always reacted, mostly in a negative fashion. Nowadays, we don't recommend any cuts, but don't forget this, 150 years ago, 1830s, so that was almost 190 years ago, uh, there was no such thing as, as limits at that time. In time, the top loop of the meander dried up, but the bottom loop continued to maintain a connection between the three rivers. This loop came to be known as the old. There was luck. There was two rivers out there. One of them dried out, so the entire flow would go into the second river and the connection between the Atchafalaya, right? So this led to the, the, to the possibility of the Atchafalaya stealing the water from the Mississippi. If it could get rid of his log jam, and it would and and with more water on the Red River, which is out of control at that point, how much water comes from the Red River, it depends much on the floods on in Arkansas. Right? So as you can see, it's all a story of flow of water. In 1839, the log jam was cleared away. In 1839, the log jam was cleared away. Why would you clear away a log jam? 1839, because people wanted to navigate the rivers, because that business, commerce, money. Right? So they cleared the log jam, 1839. In order to open up the Atchafalaya for navigation, the Atchafalaya became deeper and wider. And the Atchafalaya, once it was, had got rid of his log jam, became deeper and wider because there was water from the Mississippi coming in, obviously. <laughs> right? Can you see it? Developed a great appetite for the Mississippi. In 1953, the Corps wrote a desperate paper to Congress, state the court comes in in 1953, a uh, hundred years later. That if nothing were done in the next few years, the Mississippi would change course completely by 1990. The court estimated in 1963 that by 1990, given the trend that they've studied, and they know this very well, that the Atchafalaya was going to take over the Mississippi with the, uh, with the attendant negative aspects for both Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the entire business out there in southern Louisiana. Congress authorized the Old River Control Project at a cost of nearly $70 million. The Old River Control structure consists of two parts. The first part, called the Low Sill Structure, operates at all times and regulates how much water flows through its 11 gates. During floods, a second construction, the Open Bank Structure, can take a large part of the flow through its 73 gates. A rock was built on the old river so that navigation could continue between the Mississippi and the Atchafalaya. The entire complex was completed in 1963 and seemed a great success. But 10 years later, in 1973, a massive flood almost destroyed the ORCS. The Mississippi has gone on flood stage or goes on flood stage every 20 years. That is a well-known fact. I mean, it's not exactly 20 years, but it could be 18, it could be 25, but that is a fact. Why? That's the way Mother Nature does it. There's floods and drought, flood periods and drought periods. So droughts follow floods, floods follow droughts. So the Mississippi, we know from, from the record, that every 20 years we got to watch it because the flood's coming. The floods that I know of record, I mean, you can go back to the record and study the floods, but I know of record the 1973, which is discussed here by Burt Lancaster. The next flood was 1993, 
Then it was in 1990, the, the huge flood in 1993 that led the Army Corps to basically junk all their physical model studies, which they thought were going to give them the answers, and they realized at that time that there were no answers to be given because the river did whatever really basically it wanted. So 1993, 1973 was, was when all this stuff happened that I'm going to be talking about today. Well, I mean, Bert Lanker is going to mention that. Then 1993, subsequently the 2011 flood, so you can see the river didn't wait for eight, 20 years, 18 years was enough. The next flood still to come. 20 years from 2011 will be 2031. We'll see if it does happen or not. Floods are more persistent than droughts. Droughts can disappear, by the way. We had an example in, in Brazil where the drought on the Paraguay would come every 30 years and all of a sudden, uh, when it was expected in the year 1995, after 30 years of the last drought, it didn't show up. And only recently, the last couple of years, have we realized that it's starting to show up based on the data that is available on a daily basis. So we don't know why Mother Nature does this. All we know is that the whole entire system is cybernetic. In other words, if it goes on one side too much, it must go on the other side also to compensate in the long run in time and space. So that's the 1973, the 1993, followed by the 2011 floods in the Mississippi. Professor Raphael Kasman. Professor Raphael Kasman, Louisiana State University. I believe he's a flood expert. He's got, he's got papers on water, droughts, floods, etc. A civil engineer visited the low sill at the height of the 73 flood. He reminisces. We had a major flood, and I thought one afternoon that I'd go out and take a look and see, watch the water go through the structure. And I got out to the structure. By the way, we went over our time. If you allow me, um, we either continue and finish it, or we stop it here and continue next time. What do you feel? How do you feel? Juan? Uh, sir, I have soil dynamics after this, so like in 10 minutes. Let's go ahead and we will cut it and resume at 5 out of 947, okay? So we're going to, at this point, we're going to cut it. We shouldn't go beyond. I know you guys have things to do. So let me just, at this point, I'm going to stop the share, okay? So we stop the share. We are about halfway on the video. It's a fascinating, interesting, and very uh, uh, video that produces uh, or that gives us a lot of thoughts as to how man management of a river system should be done. So, okay, with that, then I'm going to stop in here and I'll see you. Today is Tuesday. I'll see you Thursday at 5.30, as usual. Bye-bye.